Yep. So it is truly a great honor and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Steve Gregorich. Steve received his BA in psychology and PhD in quantitative psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. Steve is a statistician, faculty member in the Department of Medicine. His research focuses on preventive health behaviors in diverse populations via clinic and community-based randomized trials, quasi-experiments, and longitudinal observational studies. Steve has been an investigator, principal statistician, and or statistical slash methodological mentor of over 80, uh, on over 80 largely federally funded centers, projects, and career development awards. He's been with the CAPS Methods Corps since the early to mid 2000s and has been a key contributor to the success of CAPS and its investigators over the years. He recently announced his retirement set for this July. We feel incredibly fortunate to have had him as a colleague all these years and are very grateful to Steve for his willingness and interest in presenting a series of talks to us this spring before he retires. Today's talk will be the third and final presentation in this series. It covers simplified power analyses for clustered sampling designs with compound symmetric covariance structure of X and Y, a survey of sample size ratios, SSR. Steve? Take it away. Thanks, Tor. Uh, let's see how these slides look. Does that look okay? I can see them beautifully. Okay. Yeah. You get your toolbar. Yeah, because before when I was just doing uh, a full screen view, people were having to zoom in. And now I'm curious of whether or not that might be contributing to fuzzy recordings. Um, so I'm just going to try it this way and see how it goes. It looks goes. fine. It looks uh, fine. Okay. So um, when I think the abstract of this talk was uh, promising that I would talk about two level and three level uh, sampling designs, and I will, but I um, curtailed some of what I was originally planning to talk about when it comes to three level designs because it was just getting too complicated and um, my head started to spin. And so I knew that everyone else's head was going to spin. So um, I would, it, it, to, go, uh, to go full in on the three level models, uh, especially with respect to uh, logistic models uh, would require another talk. So just a little bit of a warning there. Um, so here's an overview of what I want to talk about. Um, and basically it's all about sample size ratios. I call them sample size ratios. A lot of you uh, will know one sample size ratio that's known as DEF or the, the design effect. That's a sample size ratio. There's all kinds of sample size ratios out there. And I use the sample size ratio uh, label kind of generically for these because it kind of, it works for all of them. Um, I'm going to be talking about two and three level clustered sampling designs. Uh, as I said, the, um, the, the, the coverage of the three level designs is going to be limited in this talk. Uh, I just, I'm just going to give a simplified example. But throughout, um, I'm assuming compound symmetric correlation structure of both X and Y. So basically, if you have a clustered sampling design, that's often what people will assume. Uh, or if you have, say, a repeated measures designed with only two assessment times, then you have compound symmetry of the correlation between the repeated measures. If you start having more than two repeated measures, then you might start thinking about autoregressive or other banded uh, correlation structures uh, among your repeated assessments such that the uh, assessments that are closer together in time uh, might expect it to be more highly correlated than those uh, assessments that are more distal. But this is all about compound symmetry. And I'm going to talk about uh, three regression modeling frameworks. Uh, GLLM, uh, Generalized Linear Mixed Models, GEE, and Survey Sampling. And it turns out that uh, GLMM and GEE uh, will make use of the same sample size ratios, but survey sampling has a different uh, sample size ratio. Um, so 
Sample size ratios go by a lot of names, design effects, misspecification effects, variance inflation or deflation factors. Um, and I chose SSR eventually because it works in all contexts. Like a design effect is basically assuming that you're choosing between two different designs. Like, will I have a simple random sample or will I have a multi-stage clustered sample? Um, and so that's the implication there. A misspecification effect is, so for instance, you might have a, a clustered sample and you could fit uh, a mixed model to that clustered sample, or you could fit a model that assumes independent observations, which would be a misspecified model. And then you can start talking about, you know, what's the effect of fitting the misspecified model versus the correctly specified model. Um, and so, it gets a little awkward um, trying to defend these labels. So sample size label or sample size ratio just works uh, for everything. And this is what I want to do in the first couple of slides is a semi-formal introduction to sample size ratio. So if you assume a simple random sample of n observations and drawn from a population with a mean and a variance. And you can choose the usual estimator for u hat or the mean. Um, so that's that's this. And the variance of the estimator is basically the population variance divided by n. And so people learn this in like statistics 101, where the standard error of the mean is this is the standard deviation or the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Um, and so this is just the variance version of that. And you can say the precision of the estimator is the inverse of that of this uh, quantity, uh, and so basically, you've got this uh, n divided by the population variance, and so the larger n obtains a higher precision. So you increase n, this kind of precision number goes up. It's suggesting you've got more precision. So instead of this uh, mu hat estimator. Say we have an alternative estimator, which I'll just use mu hat a sub a. And we've got the same formulas here, except that, you know, we've got n sub a instead of n. And so we can just say, okay, so right here, we can say that n sub a equals the population variance times the estimator precision and you'll get this quantity here. And you can do the same thing for mu hat. And then if you take the ratio of this quantity and this quantity, it's a sample size ratio. So essentially you've got N divided by N sub A is the same thing as this quantity, which is here, divided by this quantity here. And that basically boils down to the variance of uh, mu hat sub a over the variance of that should be a hat there um, over that mu. And so basically the sample size ratio is a ratio of two sample sizes. It's also a ratio of two variances. Um, so there, that's why sometimes when people are talking about depth, they talk about how it can be used to adjust sample size. They also talk about how it is uh, it describes the ratio of, of the two expected variances from two different estimators. Um, so in a kind of a made up example, so if we had a thousand observations and mu hat sub a has a variance of two and the estimator mu hat has a variance of one, then the SSR is defined above equals two or two divided by one equals two. So a mu hat sub a has a larger variance and lower precision than mu hat. And knowing the N and the sample size ratio, we can calculate the effective sample size or NF uh, for an application of mu hat sub a. So if you've got a thousand uh, observations and a sample size ratio of two, when applying mu hat sub a, you can say that the effective sample size uh, for an application of mu hat sub a in this case is 500. 
which is the same thing as saying is when you are applying mu hat sub a with a thousand observations, uh, it's equivalent to applying mu hat with 500 observations. So it takes a larger sample size with mu hat sub a to obtain the same level of precision as it does with mu hat. Um, and then, like I said, this is talking about sample size, but you can also talk here. I don't like that pop up there. Um, you can you can um, talk about uh, relative variances. So am I going to be able to get this to go away? That did something. Okay, so now I'm just going to move into talking about example applications for a while. So this is just one example. So you're planning for a cluster randomized trial. So we're talking about a two level design here. So I've got participants nested within clusters. Clusters are level two, and we're gonna randomize clusters uh, with one-to-one -one allocation to experimental groups. So let's just pretend that all of our clusters are have even numbers of participants, and we're going to equally allocate participants within clusters to either intervention or control. And say we have a thousand observations, we've got a hundred clusters, each of size 10. So I'm using n sub two and n sub one for number of clusters and the size of each cluster. And so in this case, uh, y is continuous, normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. X is a binary with a mean of 0.5. Uh, and uh, that's the experimental group indicator. We want, we want to work with a linear regression model. We've got an intra-cluster correlation of y equal to 0.05, and we're focused on 80% power with two-tailed alpha equals 0.05. And one goal could be to solve for the minimum detectable effect size, or b sub x. Uh, and so in this context, the design effect is a useful sample size ratio. Um, and this design effect basically is one plus the, sam uh, the cluster size minus one multiplied by the intercluster correlation of Y. And I'm using R here just as a shorthand. So that's basically cluster size minus one. And that's, uh, I don't know where this was first described, but the first I know of was by Kish in his 1965 book. So in application, if I want to solve for B sub X, um, I'm first going to calculate the sample size ratio and the effective sample size. So in this case, uh, I've got one plus 10 minus one times 0 0.05, the sample size ratio is 1.45. And if I want to, uh, obtain the effective sample size, I use division the way that this uh, sample size ratio is defined. So I take 1,000 divided by 1.45 and I get about 690. Um, and so here the effective sample size is smaller than n uh, because I've got 1,000 observations, but not of the, all of those are independent of one another. And so therefore, uh, it's not like I've got a thousand observations worth of information. I've got less than that. Um, the result, so if I plug in uh, my assumptions uh, with the 689.7 as the sample size with 80% power and uh, alpha equal 0.05, and also that the variance of the outcome is one and the variance, uh, the standard deviation is really what pass is looking for, but the X variable is 0.25. Uh, pass will tell me in this linear regression routine that the minimum detectable uh, effect size is 0.212. Um, and so basically what this is telling me is that if I fit a, a GLM, uh, uh, GLMM, GEE, or in this case, a, a survey sampling uh, related model to a thousand cluster observations, it's going to obtain the same power as a plain linear regression model, all else being equal, 
fit to about 690 independent observations. And I think probably everyone is pretty familiar with that kind of uh, calculation. Um, and that's why I started with it. But we could go in the reverse direction. We could, if we started out with effect size, maybe you have an effect size that you wanna be able to power for, and you know what your cluster size is, then you can calculate what the total sample size needs to be and how many clusters you need. Um, so I could start with the, our estimated effect size and assuming independent observations, I could just plug that into pass and have pass uh, solve for the sample size I need. Uh, and pass would report 690. It doesn't report kind of fractional sample size values. Um, so 690 is, uh, it's not the same as 689.7, but it's as close as pass can get. And that's assuming independent observations. Um, so this output from pass is really our effective sample size. And what we need to do then is to use our sample uh, size ratio to figure out what the actual n should be. And so again, our sample size ratio is still 1.45 here. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna multiply the effective sample size by the sample size ratio to obtain n. And that calculation ends up being 1,000.5. And that's because of the rounding error uh, with pass reporting 690 instead of uh, something to a decimal place. And then given that, you can figure out how many clusters you need. Um, so it's about 100. And so that's just you know the basic approach to doing this. So here's a different example. Um, so the previous example was a cluster randomized trial where we're randomizing clusters. This is a RCT, say a multi-site RCT, where we're randomizing units, participants within sites. So we're not randomizing sites, we're randomizing individuals within sites. Um, and we can have the same uh, kind of setup otherwise. A thousand folks recruited, a hundred clusters of size 10, everything else is the same. Um, in this case, if we wanna solve for the minimum detectable effect size, we use a different sample size ratio. We use one minus the intercluster correlation of Y. And this is the same sample size ratio that applies to a paired t-test. Um, and so in application, if we want to solve for B sub X, we get that sample size ratio estimate, which is 1 minus 0.05 is 0.95. And then we calculate an effective sample size by dividing N by that sample size ratio. And our effective N is about 1,052 or 1,053. Uh, so in this case, the effective sample size is larger than N. And that's because, uh, as we'll discuss in a lot of detail, the intervention versus control comparison is a within cluster effect. In the example one, it, where it's a randomized uh, cluster trial, the intervention uh, versus control comparison is a between cluster effect. But here it's a within cluster effect. So the correlation actually helps you. The intercluster correlation of Y actually gives you uh, more precision. That's because the within cluster variance gets lowered. Is that is that the correct interpretation? It's because the correlation, so as you increase the correlation between uh, units in a cluster that are being compared, mm -hmm. the, it, it, if the correlation was really strong, the variation of the comparison gets reduced, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically what's going on. Um, so in this case, the minimum detectable effect reported by PASS is 0.1722. So the, the idea here is that, you know, you fit uh, some kind of a GE, say, model to a thousand clustered observations, you're going to obtain the same power 
of the same precision as a plain vanilla model fit to 1053 independent observations. Um, so, so, so far we've discussed two sample size ratios, the DEF uh, and the one minus uh, rho y. And so a question, you know, when does each apply? We've talked a little bit about that, um, but I wanna dive in here because when you're thinking about this, you really need to, um, the first thing you think about is, is the comparison a within cluster or a between cluster? comparison. Uh, and that's the kind of the first step. Um, and when you look at these, you just have to know what, uh, which you, you actually need to think about whether the comparison is within or between cluster comparison before you can select the appropriate sample size ratio. Uh, because the sample, these sample size ratios themselves don't even, they, they assume that you've already have that information and made the correct decision. It's not a part of the calculation here. Um, so um, does X have a between or within cluster effect? And to make that determination, the intercluster correlation of X is important. So even though intercluster correlation of X doesn't show up in those forms, it is important. So usually when we think about intercluster correlation, or at least when I think about intercluster correlation, I think of a variance component decomposition. So if I'm gonna think about the intercluster correlation, say of, of Y, um, I often think about, you know, it's, it's a calculation that takes the between cluster variation in the variable and divides it by the total variation. So it's the proportion, say, if we're thinking about the intercluster correlation, it's, it's the proportion of total variation that's attributable to between cluster differences um, is one way to think about it. Um, and some, like if you go to the Wikipedia ICC page, the intercluster correlation page, they'll, they'll talk about this as the modern approach to calculating intercluster correlation. Um, but it's positively biased. You can't really obtain a negative value with this uh, because it would require a negative variance and that's not possible. Um, but, and, 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 and you usually don't have a negative um, intercluster correlation of Y. It's possible, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, but negative values of intercluster correlation for X are very common, um, often by design. And so, when we're thinking about the intercluster correlation of X, it's helpful to use the unbiased formula. Oops. And this is the unbiased formula for an intercluster correlation. So in addition to the standard formula here, we've got this minus within cluster correlation divided by R, where R is a cluster size minus one uh, in the numerator. And like, so you can go all the way back to 1913 for this. Um, and so, so thinking about this, I'm gonna try to apply this in some kind of standard cases to try to help to make some more sense of this. So in a two level sampling design, the DEF or the one plus R times intercluster correlation of Y, this applies when X has a fully between cluster effect on Y. Um, and so when is that going to happen? So that's gonna happen when X is a level two variable. So if you can think about, you know, you've got a clustered sample, you've got maybe um, people and repeated measures or something like that, X is a person level variable that doesn't vary across time. Uh, and so, that X variable is going to have positive between cluster or between person variation, but it's gonna have zero within cluster variation. Uh, so if you've got, you know, what year were you born is your person level variable. It's not gonna vary based upon when you ask the person other than random errors. Um, 
And so it's going to be basically static for that for that person or cluster. Um, and so it's just a useful way to think about things. Does the variables, the X variable, does it vary across clusters? Does it vary within clusters? Uh, if it varies between clusters, but doesn't vary at all uh, within clusters, then the intercluster correlation of X equals one. And you can look at this in this. So this was, this zero here is where the within cluster variation was for both of these. And so basically, if you've got no within cluster variation, you've just got between cluster variation divided by between cluster variation and their intra cluster correlation of X equals one. Um, and so having a fully between cluster effect and having uh, and, and the X, the corresponding X variable having an intercluster correlation of one are synonymous with each other. And so I just label this as SSR B, sub B, where the B stands for between. So def is SSR B. Um, so here is uh, some kind of basic implications. Uh, so SSRB for a fully between cluster effect, that is when the intercluster correlation of X equals one, if the intercluster correlation of Y equals zero, then basically this term just zeros out and your, your sample size ratio equals one and your effective sample size equals your actual sample size. For intercluster correlation of Y that is greater than zero, uh, this term will be greater than one. And I mean, will be greater than zero, excuse me. And your sample size ratio will be greater than one. And your effective sample size is going to be less than your actual sample size. Um, and again, uh, because row Y being less than zero is rare, I'm not going to consider it in this talk. So here's um, the other sample size ratio we've discussed so far. So um, this applies when the intracluster correlation of X is at its minimum. Um, and that is synonymous with the X variable having a fully within cluster effect on Y. So for X to have a fully within cluster effect on Y, it means that it's going to have, that X variable is going to have zero between cluster variation. So every cluster is gonna have the same mean value of X is what that means. And then, but there's going to be positive within cluster variation. So, so if you've got people and say repeated measures um, or, re or repeated assessment times, uh, there's variation in those assessment times within the person, but the average assessment time value doesn't vary at all across people. Um, uh, in, in this case, you're talking about something like baseline six months, 12 months at the planning stage so that there is absolutely no variation across uh, respondents in terms of their average assessment time. And so when that happens, uh, again, here's our formula, the between cluster variation is zero. And uh, so then what you end up with is within cluster negative within cluster variation divided by cluster size minus one over within cluster variation that reduces to negative one over R. So when you have a fully within cluster effect, that means that your X variable has an intercluster correlation that is at its minimum possible value and that is always going to be negative one divided by R. So if you have uh, two, say you have a you know baseline and six months, and those are your two assessment times, and that's your level one. Uh, you know you got people and repeated assessments uh, within people. Then your minimum uh, value for the intercluster correlation of X is going to be negative one. Um, but as cluster size increases, uh, 
the minimum value, uh, the minimum intra cluster correlation of X value will become closer to zero. So eventually, you know, if you've got negative one divided by a hundred or something like that, it's going to be a lot closer to zero than negative one. Um, and so oftentimes this minimum value of the X will have a fully within cluster effect or, and, and same thing as saying X, the intercluster correlation of X will take its minimum value. This usually happens when there's a design variable, when X is a design variable. So, and it's, and again, you've got zero between cluster variation in the, in the X values. And so if you've got an RCT randomizing level one units and the proportionate allocation to intervention versus control is identical across clusters, then that's a case the that where this will hold. Cluster sizes don't need to be the same size, but let's just say each cluster is, has an even number and 50% of uh, participants within each cluster are randomized to intervention and the other half to control, then what's going to happen is the mean intervention uh, indicator value is going to be identical across clusters, even though the clusters aren't the same size. So you're still going to have zero between cluster variation and your intercluster correlation of X will be negative one minus R. And now when clusters are of different sizes, what's R, that's a different question altogether. Um, but if you have a situation where say some clusters are of size 10, other clusters are of size 11, and you're randomizing within clusters, then there's going to be some inherent difference in the number of people who are assigned to intervention or control across clusters. So there's going to be a tiny bit of between cluster variation in the mean value of the intervention group indicator. And so your intercluster correlation of X might not be exactly negative one divided by R in that case. Well, it wouldn't be, um, but it might be uh, very close to that. Um, at the planning stage, when you've got stuff like baseline six, 12 months, so that's gonna hold for every uh, person in your design. And that would have a intercluster correlation of X equal to negative one minus R. So if you had three assessment times, negative one minus R is gonna equal negative 0.5. Um, sometimes you just have designs where there's, you know, doctor, doctor patient pairs or something like that. So the indicator of role would have, uh, in this case, an intercluster correlation of that variable equal to negative one. Um, but it's not always designed because you can do things like, you can decide for analysis purposes that you're going to aggregate up level one variable values up to a cluster mean. So you've got couples who are enrolled in the study and then two couple members and you take the couple member or some couple member variables and you aggregate them, you take the mean of those, which then represents a couple level mean variable. And sometimes people then look at individual deviation scores from the couple level mean and so those individual deviation scores will always um, average to zero. And so in at least at the design stage with no missing data, um, all of the clusters or couples will have a mean deviation value of zero, but they're still going to be within couple variation in those deviation scores. So that's a case where it's not a design variable, but by construction, you're creating a situation where the intercluster correlation of those deviation scores is going to take its minimum value. Um, and then and it would, you know, couples with two people, it would be negative one for that. Um, so I just label this as SSR sub W for within. 
And so basic um, outcomes here, again, if y, if the intercluster correlation of y equals zero, then this just becomes a zero and your sample size ratio is one and the effective sample size is the actual sample size. If the intercluster correlation of y is greater than zero, then your sample size ratio is going to be less than one and your effective sample size will be greater than your true sample size. So I think we've covered everything else here. Um, okay, so, so far we've really talked about two different sample size ratios. Uh, one is for fully between cluster effects and that's um, oh, this is, yeah, this is backwards. Fully between cluster effects are when within variance is zero, and fully within cluster effects are when between variance is zero. So I apologize for that. These, I need to fix those. Um, but, you know, Intercluster correlation values of X are not limited to the minimum and one. They can range anywhere between those values. Um, and when that happens, then X can have both within and between cluster effects. Um, so probably if you're looking at like a, a intercluster correlation of X that's somewhere between the minimum and zero, um, it's probably going to be a design variable. Um, so again, you might have a situation where uh, the proportionate allocation of individuals within clusters to intervention versus control isn't exactly the same across clusters, maybe because you've got some odd numbered clusters and some even numbered clusters. A situation like that might end up with uh, something being in that range. and but you can also have observed random variables. So you, you know, you've know you got a clustered sample of neighborhoods and people within neighborhoods and you ask them, what's your income? Um, there's probably going to be some variation between and within clusters on that. And so in that case, you would expect that the intercluster correlation of X income is probably gonna be somewhere between zero and one. Um, and so there's a question. If the intercluster correlation of X is between the minimum and one, uh, what sample size ratio should you use? And the answer depends upon your modeling framework. Um, if you are using survey sampling modeling framework, you are going to have a different sample size ratio than if you're using GE or general, generalized linear mixed models. And the, the basic reason is that what survey sampling modeling framework does is it estimates uh, the fixed effect parameters, assuming independence, and then it fixes up the, um, in, with using various techniques, it then kind of adjusts the standard errors for clustering. Uh, but the standard errors are not really, you know, they're originally, and the parameter estimates, I should say, are estimated under independence. So in contrast, GEE and generalized linear mixed models are aware of the uh, intra-cluster correlation during parameter estimation. And so therefore the standard errors are different. Um, so this is just a slide of little side notes. Um, if we look at this formula for intercluster correlation of X, it makes it clear that the intercluster correlation of X will equal zero when there is some positive between cluster variation. So it's, it's a little counterintuitive uh, when, because we're used to thinking about the, the numerator only having between cluster variation in it. So then you think, well, 
the intercluster correlation is going to be zero when the between cluster variation is zero. That's not exactly the case. Um, and so it took me a while to um, kind of find this formulation. And I was really glad when I did. I don't know why it took me so long because it's been around. Um, but I didn't know about it for a while. And I was always puzzled how you would calculate the intercluster correlation of X when it wasn't at its minimum, but it was below zero. And now I know. Um, and then another thing that I wanted to emphasize is that in this talk, when uh, the intercluster correlation of X is somewhere between the extreme values, um, I'm assuming that the between and the within cluster effects are equivalent. Um, just as a shorthand. And so John Neuhaus talks about this uh, in a couple of really nice papers. And so uh, what, he's, what he's talking about is a way to decompose the uh, time varying uh, effects of time varying X variables into fully between and fully within cluster effects. Um, and then if you find that those uh, two effects of an X variable are equivalent, then you can just kind of ignore making that distinction and go ahead and estimate your model with the original time varying X variable because it means that the, um, the between and within cluster effects are essentially equivalent. Um, and so I'm just gonna focus on the circumstance where those effects are essentially equivalent in terms of magnitude. Okay, so moving on. So, so far um, we've only discussed the SSR between and the SSR within. So this is the SSR for the survey sampling regression modeling framework. And so this can accommodate any value of intercluster correlation of X, any reasonable value of intercluster correlation of X and intercluster correlation of Y. And essentially just adds this intercluster correlation of X quantity to the product term of sample size ratio for the between, fully between uh, cluster or SSRB. And so it looks like this. And so really basic results, if your uh, intercluster correlation of X equals one, then the result is the same as SSR sub B is that just a one and then you end up with one plus R times intercluster correlation of Y. When the intercluster correlation of X is at its minimum, then SSR SS just reduces to SSR sub W um, because that one negative one minus R times R just basically cancels out. And then you end up with one minus intercluster correlation of Y. Uh, but if intercluster correlation of X is somewhere in between, then the result of the sample size ratio uh, for the survey sampling framework is gonna be somewhere between the, what you would get with SSR sub W and SSR sub B. Um, so, if you are working in the survey sampling modeling framework and you have a X variable that doesn't take either it, the minimum or maximum value for its intercluster correlation, then you should be using this sample size ratio instead of either of, you know, either of the previous two. Um, as far as I know, this was first described by Scott and Holt in 1982 and the SSR SS label is mine. So here's some just very basic results. Um, you've got different values of intercluster correlation of X, the maximum, the minimum, and some values in between. This is assuming intercluster correlation of Y is 0.1. And then, so if you've got an intercluster correlation of X, the X effect type is a fully between cluster. If it's at its minimum value, it's a fully within cluster. But if it's somewhere in between, then X potentially has both between and within cluster effects. 
and then assuming uh, observed sample size of a thousand, these are the various effective sample sizes that you would obtain um, by the standard calculations here. So again, in this case, SSR sub SS and SSR sub B are identical. And same thing here for SSR sub SS and SSR sub W. But in between, you can see there's some different values. Um, so things, you get uh, more precision, precision with decreasing intercluster correlation of X holding the intercluster correlation of Y constant. Um, so probably uh, a lot of people use SSR sub B in this context. And that's assuming that you've got an intercluster correlation of X equal to one. Um, but you can see that you could really underestimate your power if you use SSRB when the intercluster correlation of X is less than one. Uh, so something to, to uh, make sure you're not underestimating your power. Um, I don't think most people probably don't use SSR sub W um, inappropriately. I think probably it's more often the case that SSR sub B gets used inappropriately. Um, but that's just speculation on my part. Okay, here's something that's much more complicated. This is the SSR for uh, either a GEE or a GLMM modeling framework. Um, and this is something I, I, I'm sure that it's, it's, basically, it's based upon Basaganya, Lau, and Spiegelman's work. Um, Basaganya did a lot of work uh, working, he was a student of Donald Spiegelman's, and uh, this was his dissertation work. And he wrote a lot of R software and published a lot of really interesting papers. Um, but they've been, a lot of them have kind of been ignored. Like I looked at this paper, which is the, the paper I used uh, to kind of derive this. I looked on Web of Science, it's been cited four times. And it's really, really important paper that really gets into power analysis for these clustered sampling designs with time varying covariates because most of the work out there either assumes that the intercluster correlation of X is taking its minimum value or its maximum value. And for X variables that are have middling values, uh, there's not much help out there. And this work was really important work that just hasn't been embraced enough yet, in my opinion. Um, but they reported a sample size ratio that assumed compound symmetry um, of X and Y versus uh, intercluster correlation of X equals one, and but compound symmetry of Y. And what I wanted was a something that compared compound symmetry to uh, independence. And so uh, I show in the appendix how I got here from their equation 3.5. And so this form is kind of interesting because it's got SSR sub B and SSR sub W in the numerator. And then it's got this kind of ugly mess down here. Um, this one though I like because I can, if my, if my head is in the space of all these calculations, I can remember this one because the numerator and the denominator basically have the same form except for these two values are different. Um, so here's some basic results of this sample size ratio. Uh, again, if the intercluster correlation of X equals one, this boils down to SSR sub B. And if the intercluster correlation of X takes its minimum value, it also boils down to 
SSR sub W. Um, but if the intercluster correlation of X is somewhere in the middle, then this SSR is less than the SSR for survey sampling, which means that the effective sample size for a GEE or a GLMM model will be larger than the effective sample size for the survey sampling modeling framework. So if you have an X variable with an intercluster correlation that is not at one of the extremes and you have a choice of modeling framework, you will do yourself a favor by fitting a GEE or a GLMM model instead of a survey sampling modeling framework model. Um, so this is just an example of SSRGE versus SS. So we've got a two level clustered sampling design with a thousand observations, intercluster correlation of Y equals 10 and R equals 10. So meaning cluster sizes of 11 a range of row X values and holding intercluster correlation of Y at 0.1. And so this shows the, the, the different effective sample sizes. And again, when intercluster correlation of X takes an extreme value, you get the same result, but in between you get some differences. And in this case, they're not huge. This is like, you know, a 10% advantage of using a GEE or a GLMM model versus a survey sampling model in terms of effective sample size. Um, but this is just one example. Um, here's another example where, let's say you had repeated measures. And so now you've just got uh, uh, cluster sizes of two and an intercluster correlation of 0.5, which is not unreasonable in a lot of uh, cases where you've got repeated measures. And then for some of these middling values um, of the intercluster correlation of X, you've got uh, an advantage of like a 33% increase in effective sample size. And it can get more than that. So this is just, this is a grid showing various values of intercluster correlation of X and various values of intercluster correlation of Y. And then the top bold number is the effective sample size that you would obtain under this set of circumstances, row X and row Y, if you fit a GE or generalized linear mixed model uh, and the regular non-bolded numbers, the effective sample size, if you fit a survey sampling model. And so they're gonna be the same if there's no intercluster correlation of Y. They're gonna be the same if the intercluster correlation of X is at its minimum. And they're gonna be the same if the intercluster correlation of X is at its maximum. But in the middle, there's some differences. Um, one of the things that you notice is that these yellow uh, boxes here show that if the intercluster correlation of X equals the intercluster correlation of Y, then SSRGE is going to equal one. So basically your effective sample size is your sample size in that circumstance. Um, that is not well known. Another thing is if you just take it as, as an example, say your intercluster correlation of X was 0.6 and your intercluster co correlation of Y was 0.9. So if your outcomes are like biometric related, so if you're doing a lifestyle intervention and you're looking at weight loss and you're comparing people's weight as their outcome variable longitudinally, getting intra-person correlations of weight above 0.9 is typical. So there are circumstances where the intercluster correlation of the outcome 
is uh, really substantial like that. And if you had some kind of uh, random, you know, respondent variable, like an attitude that you were measuring uh, at different points in time, it could be that the intraperson uh, correlation of that variable could be substantial as well. So if you look at this situation, um, the effective sample size, if you fit a GEE or a generalized linear mixed model, is almost four times higher than it is if you fit a survey sampling model. Um, so the other thing um, to notice is that the if the intercluster correlation of X is smaller than the intercluster correlation of Y, that's everything above the diagonal, the effective sample size for the GEE or GLMM uh, modeling framework is going to be larger than the actual sample size. Um, but if the intercluster correlation of X is larger than the intercluster correlation of Y, then the effective sample size for GEE or GLMM is going to be less than the sample size. The same is not true for survey sampling. Basically, as soon as you get above a intercluster correlation of X uh, uh, beyond you know, in the positive range, your effective sample size is going to be smaller than your actual sample size. So all of these values below here, they're all less than a thousand. So, you know, the, the differences can be extreme. Like this is a five-fold plus difference up here uh, in that situation. So again, use GEE or GLMM uh, over survey sampling when you can. Um, so that was all linear models. And you can do this with logistic models, but there's some things you need to be aware of. Uh, because all these power calculations are basically using standard routines like pass uh, for uh, SRS samples as the as a kind of a backbone of the calculation. Um, you need to think about population average effect sizes as inputs, um, and so or if you're using, you know, if you're just going to use like the percent of uh, folks in intervention with a, a yes on the outcome versus the percent of folks in the control group uh, with, a, with a yes on the outcome, then those should be population average focused things like observed outcome probabilities. They shouldn't be model predicted outcome probabilities from a mixed model. Um, they can be observed outcome probabilities from a GEE model. Um, or, you know, if you're gonna have an effect size estimate, like the log odds um, uh, for an effect uh, size as input, that should be from a GEE model, not from a mixed model, because mixed models are gonna give you unit specific estimates of fixed effects, and those are on a different scale than population average. Um, and the way I like to think about it is basically in the, in the SRS world, it's, it's a population. There is no difference between population average and unit specific, but it's not unit specific. <laughs> you know, you can say a plain vanilla logistic regression is not unit specific, but you could say it is population average. Um, and it's also true for your estimates of intercluster correlation of X and intercluster correlation of Y. Those should come, those should be population average in nature. Those should come from the GEE model. If you've got an intercluster correlation of Y that is uh, from a generalized linear mixed model, then it's not appropriate input for these analyses. It's going to be too high. And, and it's it's kind of in the logistic, and this is all about, you know, binary outcomes. Um, the intercluster correlations are not correlations uh, per se, uh, especially in the linear 
model world. Uh, but when, when if you try to make an analogy to correlations in uh, with a binary outcome and a logistic model, a GEE analysis will give you an intercluster correlation of Y that is like a phi coefficient or a Pearson correlation. The intercluster correlation that you get from a generalized, you know, like a, lin a logistic mixed model, that's more like a tetrachoric correlation. It's 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 more akin to looking at the correlation of the continuous underlying latent variable uh, that's underlying the binary outcome. And so it's not it's not of based upon the observed data. Um, and so you just need to pay attention to that because um, if you've got data in hand, then you can do whatever you want. If you're getting uh, estimates of intercluster correlation from the literature, then you, uh, if, and you're getting those from someone's uh, mixed model, those are gonna be too high. And so that's the concern. Um, too far. Um, yeah, and you can use ALR too for the uh, estimates of X effects, but you can't get uh, intercluster correlation values that are population average from a ALR being alternating logistic regression, which is an alternative to GEE. Um, Let's see here. I think that's it for that. Um, so I want to look at some simulation results. Um, so basically, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna have this big grid, and so um, I've got two level model. There's 63 combinations of row x and row y values. So row X is going to range from minimum to maximum. Row Y is going to range from 0 to 0.9. And I've got 10,000 replicate samples per combination of row X and row Y. And basically, what I did is I fit a regression model that assumed independent observations, so just like a regular linear regression model, uh, to each replicate sample. And I saved the standard error estimates. And then I fit uh to, again to the re uh modeling all the data uh basically using a mixed model and then i'm saving each of the standard error estimates for the effect of x uh, assuming clustering versus independence and then i can calculate a sample size ratio uh, by basically getting the ratio of the standard errors and then squaring them for each replicate sample within each combination of row X and row Y. So just like you know, we talked earlier about how a sample size ratio can be thought of as a ratio of two sample sizes or the ratio of two variances, this is basically using the standard errors to obtain a ratio of two variances, assuming clustering or ignoring clustering. And then you can compare the SSR uh, that you obtain from the simulation to the one you calculate with the standard calculation. And so this is using SSR sub GE with small clusters. So these are clusters of size two, R equals one. And I'm fitting a GEE linear regression model. So the simulated sample size ratios are in bold on top in each cell, uh, and the calculated are what I call expected here, um, based upon the formula, uh, are below in each cell. And you can see that it performs very well, um, regardless of the combination of intercluster correlation of X and Y. So it's really tight. Um, Again, um, 
everything, this is the diagonal where row X equals row Y, and we have the expectation is that it, the effective, uh, the sample size ratio will be one, so that the effective sample size equals the sample size. And everything above the diagonal is where the intercluster correlation of X is less than the intercluster correlation of Y, and that's where the sample size ratio is going to be less than uh, one. And so your effective sample size is going to be greater than the observed sample size and everything in orange then is where the reverse holds and you start taking a hit on your effective sample size. So that's looking at the GE linear regression framework. Here's the GLM M linear regression framework where we're still using the same sample size ratio SSR sub GE. Everything else is the same. The data is the same. Uh, it's just a different model and we get the same results. So um, GEE or GLMM, either way, you're going to get the same pattern of efficiency gain or loss depending upon your combination of row X and row Y. So here's survey sampling using the SSR sub SS, um, otherwise the same exact setup and it also does very well. However, you can see, as we mentioned before, the, the sample size ratio equals one uh, here when either uh, intercluster correlation of Y equals zero or the intercluster correlation of X equals zero. Uh, it's only gonna be less than one when the intercluster correlation of X is below zero and otherwise for positive intercluster correlation of X and positive intercluster correlation of Y, the sample size ratio is going to be larger than one and your effective sample size is going to be less than uh, your actual sample size. Um, oh, this is just larger clusters just to show that there's, you know, it, it holds even if you vary cluster size before all of the clusters were of size two. Here they're of size 51 uh, and so it still performs very well. But, you know, uh, on a percentage basis, the differences are tiny. Um, so all that was a linear model. This is a logistic model. And what do I have here? Oh, R equals two, is that really true? Is it really two or is it one? I'm not sure, but it, it gets a little tricky. What I did is I had, oh, this says M equals 500. That, that should be N2. That's the number of, of clusters. Um, and I, I don't really know very well how to simulate uh, data from a GEE model. So I had to simulate data from a linear mixed model or a logistic mixed model and I think what I did is I specified that the intercluster correlation of Y from that model would be 0.5. And then I had to go and estimate a bunch of GEE models to see what the intercluster correlation of Y was um, as a population average estimate. And it, I think it was 0.349. So the difference between 0.5 for a unit specific intercluster correlation versus 0.35 for a population average gives you a sense of how much larger your intercluster correlation estimates can be if they're from a mixed model versus a GE model. Um, this is 50K replicate samples. These are multivariate models. Everything before was just these bivariate models. With this, com this combination was one, that was another combination. This is a multivariate model so I've got six different X variables with different intercluster correlation values. Um, and so I just fit this model. I've got the expected, um, and I may have, may have uh, switched the way I'm labeling things, but the expected here is the calculated sample size ratio and the simulated is based upon the comparison of uh, standard error estimates from an independence model versus a cluster aware model. Um, and so they're very close. Um, and then this is the um, 
the expected effective sample size, assuming a sample size, of, a, a real sample size of a thousand. Um, and then this is power. So I calculated power using pass with the effective sample size, given the other kinds of, you know, out, the outcome expectations and things like that. And then the simulated is just the percentage of, or the proportion of, of samples or replicate samples that had um, a, where the effect uh, was less, the P less than 0.05. So they're very close. It's, I find that when you're trying to back calculate power, um, it can be a little bit noisy. So that's, I think that's why I went up to 50K replicate samples, but it's pretty close. But you know, these, these also suggest that it's closer than these values uh, suggest things. But that's for survey sampling. This is for GEE. And again, um, in this multivariate model, SSRGE worked very well and then this is just showing the kind of the relative relative benefit of the effective sample size of, of the GEE model versus the survey sample model. So again, here not nothing profound, uh, but it depends on the circumstances um, of your of your study design. So it works for logistic regression as well, but again when you're working with pass, you need population average parameter or, you know, fixed effect parameter estimates, if that's an input, uh, and you need a uh, population average estimate of the intracluster correlation. Okay, where are we? It's already 1217. Okay, I will try to do this. Um, I didn't realize I was so far behind. The three-level clustered sampling design, I decided to simplify this. Um, the idea is that it's a multi-site RCT. We've got sites as the top-level clusters. We've got people within sites who are the units of randomization, and we've got repeated assessments within people. Um, it is the simplified design because I'm going to assume that the, any site-level variable it, well, by definition, it can only have between site effects. So it has a fully between site effect, X3. X2 is a person level variable, and we're going to assume that the intercluster correlation of X is taking its minimum. And also for repeated assessments, we're going to assume that the intercluster correlation is taking its minimum value. Um, so this is just trying to simplify things in that way to keep your and my head from spinning. Um, in three level models, there are often three different ways that people, well, two different ways um, that people talk about intercluster correlation. So people also often talk about intercluster correlation within level three. Um, I need to fix my notation here. Um, and so that's just the proportion of variance attributable to sites in this case. So you've got your, your between site variance and your total variance. And then when people talk about intercluster correlation at level two, sometimes what people are reporting is the intercluster correlation at level two and three. Um, so they take the, the between site and the between person variation in the numerator and divide it by the total variation. Um, so this could be thought of as the, the uh, similarity of any two assessments uh, within sites. And this could be thought of the similarity of any two assessments within people and sites. Um, but sometimes when people report the intercluster correlation at level two, what they're reporting is this, which is the proportion of variance attributable to patients. Um, and so you will see this quantity and this quantity both described as the intra-cluster correlation at level two or the inter-person correlation. So you really need to um, try to understand what 
people are reporting uh, when they're when they're reporting those quantities if you're going to use them uh, as as an input for your calculations. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to take it one step at a time. So for X3, X3 is a site level variable or the level three top level cluster variable. And the intercluster correlation is, that should be a row, not a P, um, is uh, one. So the effect of X3 is going to be a fully between site effect. And so my initial, so for every single one of these, I have an initial incorrect conjecture. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna share. So I just thought, well, you know, this is a between site effect. So it's just gonna be SSR between, between sites. Um, so I thought, you know, in this case, I've got uh, 10 uh, people per site and two observations per person. So the cluster size, the site cluster size is 20. So I'll just use the standard formula here using uh, row Y, uh, the, the, the uh, within site uh, correlation. And, you know, it kind of works sometimes, but it didn't really work. And then I realized that um, when you're looking at between site variation in a three level design, the intra-site correlation that you need to use completely ignores level two. And you can't just fit a three-level model and then throw the level two variance out. You need to actually fit a two-level model that's just got site-level clusters and not even make the model aware of person-level clusters. And so, um, this quantity is estimated from uh, it. It this is actually estimable from a three-level model, but you got to know how to do the reapportion the, the variance. And so the idea is that you could do it two ways. You could fit a two-level model and then just calculate the intrasite correlation based upon the variance components from a two-level model, and that's what this two is supposed to represent. Or you could fit a three-level model. And then uh, this uh, woman, uh, Morbeek, I was thankful to find her paper that describes how you calculate the intrasite correlation from a three-level model uh, that, you, that the intrasite correlation that you would obtain had you fit a two-level model, ignoring uh, the person level. And so, you can look at our calculations, but if, if you just represent the, if, if we're just talking about proportion of variance attributable to sites, to people, to, um, it should say measures, uh, so that this all adds up to one, because I'm accounting for all the variance, um, including the residual down here, um, you can calculate this, uh, the intercluster correlation of Y that you would obtain from a two-level model given the inputs from a three-level model. And so uh, this is the calculation. And instead of 0.05, I get 0.055263 in this case. And so then I use that in the standard calculation and my SSR for the, for the X variable at level three is, is 2.05. So I needed to modify my intercluster correlation of Y in this case. And then for SSR at level, uh, for an X variable at level two, so here the level two variable is the intervention group uh, indicator and the intercluster correlation of X is at the minimum. And so my initial conjecture is I would have, well, it's, it's a between site effect and a within person effect. Uh, I mean, excuse me, within site between person effect. So I just thought, well, I'll have SSRW here and SSRB here um, with the appropriate intercluster correlations here. Uh, but that's not right. Uh, one way to think about this is this quantity needs to be adjusted for this quantity. 
so that this is kind of like a sample size and but this is a within cluster effect so i need to kind of adjust my sample size for this effect at a higher level and so that's what this does and then it turns out that i can do it this way or equivalently i can do it this way if i have this different estimate of the intercluster correlation of y uh, which is kind of like i fit a three-level model and i just uh, i take the the variance component for sites and I just throw it away. I just I just remove it from the, uh, so once I got my estimates, I just completely ignore the site level estimates. And given that I can calculate my, uh, this value of the intercluster correlation of Y uh, at, at the person level, it, it's not 0.1, it's 0 0.10526 and I can calculate my sample size ratio. And then for an X variable at level one, I just thought, well, it's a within within, it's within site and within person effect. So we just have my two SSR sub W's uh, with a, a corresponding intercluster correlation of Y values. Uh, but that's not quite right because I need to use that same modified uh, intercluster correlation of Y at the person level that I did in the previous uh, slide. And so uh, when I do that, um, I get this sample size ratio of 0.85. And so this is um, the kind of simulation results. Uh, so I've got this level three X variable with an intercluster correlation of X of one, and then I've got these two other variables at level two and level one with the minimum uh, intercluster correlation of X values. So this X3 is a between site effect. X2 is a within site between person effect. And X1 has a within site within person effect. Um, and these are the intercluster or these are the proportion of variance accounted for for each of those levels in the outcome. These are the modified values of these based upon the calculations that I showed you previously. These are the um, sample size ratios that I, uh, the, GE, the SSR GE sample size ratios that I um, presented on the previous slides. And these are the simulated ones. Uh, so again, the correspondence is, is really good. And this just shows the calculations uh, for these right here. Um, so it works well, and this is just other designs. So um, in summary, proper use of these sample size ratios requires that you pay attention to what the intercluster correlation of X is. And so the first thing you really need to do is try to understand, does X have a fully between cluster effect, a fully within cluster effect, or maybe something in the middle. Um, SSRB is, is probably the best known of all of these. And therefore I worry about it being over applied, especially because if you apply it inappropriately, you're gonna substantially underestimate your power or you're gonna substantially overestimate your sample size requirements. Um, and so beware of that. Um, and again, when you have a choice and the intercluster correlation of X is somewhere between the extremes, you should be fitting a GEE or GLMM model instead of survey sampling. Um, again, this is all about compound symmetric correlation structure of X and Y. Um, and for three level logistic models, that's gonna retire, that's, that's gonna require a future talk for sure. Um, and so just for your amusement, I, um, you all can ponder this quiz. A quiz? Oh yeah. no. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the answers to the quiz are at the, at the end of the slide set, but then there's also, this is an appendix for the, uh, how I got to SSR BLS, or I say BLS, it should be GE. Oh no, sorry. This is what um, Basaganya reported in his paper. And then this is how I got to SSR GE from that. Um, 
and these are some basic results of SSR GE, but um, yeah, just to, just to practice <laughs> if you're interested. Anyway, sorry I went long. I thought I was uh, only gonna take an hour to do this and give us some time for questions. This is complicated. Yeah, I know. I kind of felt bad about saying simplified uh, in the panel. <laughs> well, uh, thank did, God it is the simplified version. Right. <laughs> did, yeah. When did you, you think start, about publishing, Steve? Yeah, well, I thought about it, but... Um, you should. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, one I, of those things. I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, in, in your retirement in your retirement years, but no, I think uh, I think it would be a benefit to to people. And I was actually pleased to learn, it's like, oh, okay, I didn't pay attention to that, but at least the you know the sample size was overestimated. So a, a waste of resources is worse than oh my god, I gave a consult and underpowered somebody's study. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of you know you don't want to do either one though, unfortunately, because mm. the 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 ethical consideration comes in if you right. kind of over recruit. Um, so it's probably better for a low risk study to over recruit than to under recruit, but even so it's consideration. Well, and, and I always try and tell people, you know, with cluster randomized study, it, you know, things happen in the real world where it's quite possible you can lose one or two clusters. And so I always try and, you know, oh, yeah. ad advise people to, okay, well, this is the number, you know, this is the, the cluster size for your clinic and this, okay, this is the number of clinics you need, but I would like add two more because bad things like seem to routinely happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, power analysis is a lot of hand waving and pulling stuff out of wow. the sky. So uh, all of your assumptions could be really off <laughs> in either direction. <laughs> But well, maybe not of recruitment. It's not going to be off in the recruitment direction. You're not going to have like, oh, I, gee, I found these extra 10,000 participants. But in terms of um, effect sizes or retention rates or intercluster correlations, you know, all, all those things can be uh, very different from what you thought they might be for sure. Yeah. Well, well thank you, Steve. Sure. Yeah, this was terrific. Uh, thank you, Steve. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. I can't say, I cannot say I enjoyed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is grass, yes. It, but but it, it was great. And you, you're going to correct the typos and send me the, the correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I hope I can remember them. New hat and between, oh, yeah. within. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then there's a P instead of a row or something like that, right? Right. P yeah, there's a P instead of a row. And then there was, um, there was like L2 and L3 instead of like S for site and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for um, attending. And uh, thank you, Stu. It's thank good you. for me because I figured out a few things while I was putting the slides up together, so. That usually nice. happens. Yeah, it's very cool. I, I would endorse Edwin's suggestion to publish it. Uh, I know you've got like a month left of official time, so I don't <laughs> know that that's really realistic. But uh, it sure would be nice to cite it, you know, to be able to say yeah, when, when I mean, referring I, to a formula in a grant application or something. There's like I, I have done like. I've done a ton of simulations related to this, a lot I didn't show. And at some point I was calculating the number of simulated data records that I processed. And it was, it was like in the billions. I mean, I mean, cause if you're gonna, if you're gonna have like 50,000 replicate samples that you're gonna estimate with three or four different models, you know, so I'm talking about processed, not generated. Um, but no, it's crazy. There's There's been a lot of kind of stuff going on. My computer's been humming away for sure. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. Excellent. Thank this you. This was fantastic. Take care, guys. Yeah. Yeah.